everyone and welcome back to Getting Dead, the podcast with me, Brogan. Today, I sit down with the incredible Kelsey Parker. We discuss all things motherhood, grief, and her journey into finding alternative therapies. I hope you enjoy it. Kelsey. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Ever since I met you, there's something about you that's just so captivating. And um, I kind of went down the Kelsey Parker rabbit hole, you know, in order to have you on today. Okay. And it's almost What have you learned about me? (laughs) I was just like, where the fuck do I start? Because for me, like, hats off to any woman who could be the girlfriend of a guy that's in one of the biggest boy bands in the world, traveling the world, seems to remain sane and unjealous and stable throughout it all because um i know that i would be probably like a quivering wreck and when i fell down the kelsey rabbit hole you seem to define for me is like shit happens and you just seem to keep moving so there's a few things i want to touch today obviously tragically your husband passed but i know some of the conversations We've had away from that. It's been a bit of a learning curve and stuff for you. Yeah. But um, just for people who don't know much about Tom and his sickness, like if you could just summarise maybe what happened. Uh, so Tom got diagnosed. I was I've been with Tom since I was like nineteen wild. years old. Wild, wild, and like when you go back to that of why I I could just be thrown in that situation and get on with it because I just think what's the point of worrying. Like, you know, worrying about if he's going to cheat on me. If he's going to cheat on you, he's going to cheat on you. That is it at the end of the day. Like, and then I think with that, because I am quite, I've got a strong mind. When Tom was diagnosed, so Tom was diagnosed with a brain tumour, stage four, glioblastoma, glioblastoma. That's what I say, but I think most people call it a glio. Um, But when he, so he, he got diagnosed with that. I was 35 weeks pregnant with my little boy and I had a 15 month old baby as well. Um, Tom, and a dance school. And a yeah. dance school and loads of other stuff going on. But yeah, Tom was drugged out. Oh, we was in lockdown as well. We were in COVID. Oh, Jesus. So um, yeah, when Tom got diagnosed, it obviously was the biggest shock of our whole entire life. Like I didn't, when he kept saying to me, oh, I've got, I've got this going on. He did keep taking himself to the hospital. So he kept going to me. There's something wrong with me, Kels. There's something wrong with me. And I did think a bit like, oh, it could be man flu or whatever. Mm. Um. But he kept taking himself to the hospital being like, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. And then he actually had a seizure and was taken into hospital. And then they told him he had a brain tumour. Um, but from that day he was diagnosed, we just moved forward and and we just tried to remain positive. And I think because I'm quite a positive person, I think that's what has pushed me through. Do you think your mindset when he was so poorly gave him a longer life? Well, no, that was like me being like, yeah, 100% no, but it was 100 me. Years, yeah. But no, yeah, I didn't treat him any different to what I treated him before. So I would be like, you need to get up, you need to do the dishwasher, you need to do this, you need to do whatever. Like, come on, Tom, we've got to move forward. And I had two kids as well. I just, you know, I had that positive mind. I was like, Tom, you're not going to die. You're going to be fine. You are going to be fine. And I think, because I kept telling him, I'm going to be, you're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. Like, I think if I had crumbled with him, because he, when he was first diagnosed, he kept going to me, I'm going to die. I'm yeah. going to die. And I was like, you're not going to die. You'll be fine. You're going to be fine. I'm going to make sure that you're going to be fine. And I think because he knew I believed that so much that he had me and we had the power together, then that's how we did have 18 months. Did you believe that though? A hundred percent at the time? Or was that like you weren't letting your brain go anywhere else? I think I wasn't letting my brain go anywhere else. But straight away for me, right, this is what sort of person I am. So Tom sat there Googling how long he's got left to live. I honestly jumped on Google and I was finding people that survived. How many years have they survived with this? What's the survival rate? Like, then I met Dave Bowen. He was 10 years survivor. So I reached out to Dave like... I wasn't going down that rabbit hole that Tom was. I was on a different path, like path going, Tom, these people are surviving. Like this woman in America's had it for however long. She's, she might have had 20 million surgeries, but yeah, yeah, yeah. she's still going. Yeah. So I was just, I just went down like positive survival. And so I was listening to one of your podcasts. I think it was um, made by mamas or something. And you were like, I'm fine. And, and I was like, are you? Like when you look back, Obviously, then you're like, was I'm it, fine. Did I have the made by mamas when I was actually 
when Tom was ill, I yeah, think. Yeah, when Tom yeah. was ill. And you were like, I'm fine. I'm Honestly, I have a great day. It's like, I don't know why I'm not allowed to have a great day. It's really bizarre. And I thought, now on reflection and you look back at that person, do you think you were okay? Honestly, I think I was actually okay because I was just living. I was living it. So mm. I every day, like, obviously... It was the worst situation to be in. Now, if I could have changed it with anything, of course I would have. But that was our life and that's what we had to live. So what's the point of moaning about it? Just fucking get on with it. And so like you say, so you went down this rabbit hole of like, let's find the positive stuff. Let's keep you alive. And throughout that, I know you experienced with some kind of like natural remedies and some things that like are coming a bit to the forefront now. Because like years ago, people would be like, that's chemo and radio and that's it. And like I said, going back to that podcast, you were like, look, we didn't have time to think. We just went straight into the radio, went straight into the chemo. And a couple of weeks ago, I had a girl in here called Hope and she went exactly the same. She's like, you don't have time to think. Two days later, you're in. I was under chemo, I was under radio. You don't have time to think. Honestly, no. they don't give you time. But the second time round, they did because it was the 23rd of December and they wouldn't bring her back into like the 29th. And through that rabbit hole, she went through all the alternative stuff as well. And she's like, I'm so grateful I did because I found out so much. So I feel like you're a little bit of, you're just like a fountain of knowledge when it's come to stuff that, can assist with people who are maybe undergoing chemo or radio and like what is it if you've learned that you feel like the world needs to hear i think the world needs to hear that there's so much more out there than what we're told and i think we for me because we was in the covid times like something didn't feel right across the board and i felt i need to I, there's something i need to explore within me like there's got to be more out there especially when tom was diagnosed and they told me that the standard of care has hasn't changed in 30 years and this is all he's getting because you almost think that they're going to give you like that magic, magic wand and go oh he's going to be all right so he's got stage four but this is what we're going to do and you know i uh, do a lot of treks with like um, Copperfield for breast cancer and the girls have and the women are like incredible and so inspiring but they have so many more options like there's options for them Tom didn't have an option it was radio chemo that's it there was no immunotherapy the immunotherapy they give to brain tumour um, patients is for melanoma cancer so it's not even for brain cancer so for me it was like I've got to do something here so I went down a rabbit hole and I just explored and um, do you know what I'm so grateful and thankful for that experience because I've met some magical people along the way who have have changed my life. So what did Tom's protocol look like when you started incorporating the stuff you'd learned? Oh, Raga, what didn't it look like? Oh my <laughs> we had a girl in here, she's like, on all fours. Uh, I was yeah. putting this CBD in here, I was putting that in there. She was like, then I was colonicking myself. Yeah. She was like, literally, no, I was fucking... they say to do that. They say to do the, um, it's not... Because when I listen to What's your to us... own one called? Oh my God, what is it Pessary. called? Pessary. No, 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 it's not. It's called something. But they, when we went to Spain... Um, they said to do it. Oh my God, it's going to really annoy me. The name <laughs> we'll of what it's called. But when I listen to your stuff, it's almost like Tom went, there's the reins. You're in charge of this shit. Yeah, and he did. And it's so interesting with that because our dynamic of our relationship, Tom was always in charge. I mean, I would like give him ideas and stuff, but ultimately Tom would like sort out the finances, everything like that. And I um, would just go along with whatever Tom said. But what was quite funny was even just even before Tom actually got diagnosed, I actually spoke about this the other day on what did I speak about? I can't remember what I spoke about it. But um when where uh, so we had a friend who uh, like a, a distant family friend that had, her little girl had been diagnosed with a brain Jesus. tumor. And Tom was reaching out to my best friend Kelsey going, you need to tell the mum that she, he, she needs to do this and that. And I went, Tom, you can't just tell people what their kids should be doing. Like, who even are you? Um but he believed in 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 other stuff. Alternative. In it's, alternative. And it's not like we're sitting here going, it's a fucking conspiracy, right? No. But I, the it lady that came on, him. she went, you know, like you said, she, chemo hasn't actually changed. I think it's in 42 years now, right? Yeah. Think about how much your iPhone's changed. Think yeah. about how, if you just go outside, how the world has changed. And listen, it's an interesting episode, but she goes on to raise 1.2 million quid to trial this drug, blah, blah, blah. Get So this drug is so productive that you don't need anything else yeah. to cancel it, Yeah. A big pharma company pulls it. 
and it gets plugged. Yeah. They buy it, so you can't, because then you don't need the other stuff. But so there's there's something going on here from my point of view. I'm not speaking for you, where it's like, all right, how has this chemo and the radio not changed, right? And like we're saying, we're almost at the mercy of what we're being sold and told. And when you're vulnerable and you're like, well, I'm not a doctor, so you just take everything for gospel. But one of the things that I want to do, especially with this podcast, is like make the information someone like you, who's like a normal everyday person, like accessible to people yeah. that are going through this treatment. It's not sitting here saying, don't do this. But it's like, look, you Explore. could blow. But for me as well, I think you have to go with your gut. And when we got handed this chemo book, I just wanted to rip the thing up and burn it. Like, I don't, mm. like, I just can't believe that they're giving people a book that that's telling you to eat sugar, drink fizzy drinks, have ice lollies. Like, what? Yeah. So that's. So I've never seen anything like that. So they'll say like, oh, if you're in chemo, like, and you're and you can't eat, have an ice lolly. But for me, I, I you know, I I studied what sugar does to you, and you know, just all of us. There's so many preventatives that we could do through our life, and I think that's what it's taught me now. You know. I'm not saying that I can cure anyone, like come to me and I'll cure you. But if we put things into place now, like drinking the right water, eating the right food, exercising, taking supplements, doing certain things, you know, maybe we wouldn't be in this space where one in, you know, one in two have got cancer now. And and it's weird because Tom was always obsessed with cancer. He used to be like to me, oh, it's one in five. Oh, Kels, it's one in three. And then it's like, it's one in two and now it's you. Interesting. So when, what did you start to incorporate that you think like could have given Tom, Tom some extra time or that you found useful for someone that's going undergoing these kind of treatments? Well, definitely um, some special oils that actually uh, the top, like doctors at the top were telling us. So there is, a, so this cannabis oil, but you can actually get a cannabis oil called Sativex, which is from the pharmaceutical industry. But in the brain tumour world, that is only in phase two of trials. Okay. So everyone could have this set of X, but it's not gone through but the But you phases. could have it at your own choice? You, you can pay ask. for it. So you have to pay for it. So we paid for that. So Tom did like 12 sprays a day of this set of X um, and then did other oil at night. And is he running around the front room tracing dragons or was he all right? He was absolutely fine. And it was so good for him. Like um, I met a guy and he reached out to me and... He obviously wanted Tom to take the Sativex. And I mean, this guy was in like his 70s and his wife had been taken to the hospice and she was she had a, her tumour removed and he said half her memory sat at King's Hospital. And then a, a, a nurse said to him, have you, have, have you seen this trial that they've got, which is called Sativex? You have to pay for it. It's £400. I think you get three bottles, but like literally Tom was going through that. Like he was smashing the sprays out because he'd forget as <laughs> Did well. Did you ever go? Oh, you couldn't be like, pregnant. Yeah, I was like, Tom, you've already sprayed that. He's like, Yeah, I need it again. <laughs> He's just like sprayed it like candy. Um, but this lady started with twelve sprays a day. She's now three and a half years down the line, and she's absolutely fine. She's not in the hospice, and she's living her life. Yeah, my little mate Martin, oh, so how cute. Lovely. I bet you've met so many. I have met so many people, and you know, and we've lost a lot of people along the way. And I bet that was quite scary when you lost the first few like people that were on the journey with you. I suppose I don't want to speak for you, but then I suppose it all becomes a bit real. Yeah, and I think in the brain tumor c community as well, it, it, you're so scared because there is not a lot of options that we all sort of like cling together. So I met like mums, and and that just was breaking my heart. Like uh, I've got a really good friend called uh, Louise, and she had gorgeous George, and he was like. Uh, what was George 12 when he was diagnosed? And he, he literally died within like the year. Gorgeous George. But she went, she flew to America. I mean, there's just no option here. You have to go other places. Is that because the likelihood of getting a brain tumour is quite small then compared to other cancers? It's not as well researched. It's, I think it's the lack of research. Yeah. So brain the brain tumour world only get from the NHS, we only get 1% of, fu of funding. Okay. So only 1% of research so what do these research centers look like what are they doing why is Sativex still in phase two of trials like yeah. I get so angry when I go to places and you can literally see me stood there and I'll have like steam coming out of my ears because I'm like you know that there's more out there like why are we not doing anything 
Or like another conversation that we picked up through privately said you were going to hospitals and they're feeding everyone who's like fighting for their life shit. Yeah. Shit food. And it's like, you, you, I mean, you haven't even got to be a doctor to know and look out there. That, like you say, we know that sugar fuels certain diseases. We know like gluten and all this other massively processed stuff. And yet they're feeding it to patients in a hospital. And it's like your, f- your food can become your mes- medicine. And, and do you know what? Looking back with Tom's cancer and the chemo that he actually got, it was tablet form. So we actually went home and he took, like, he, we didn't have to go into hospital loads. Okay. So we didn't have to sit in hospital and get, uh, Tied like, up and, to anything. Yeah, yeah. He literally took that chemo tablet at home. So we were fortunate that I could cook him them the meals that I wanted him to eat at home. But, you know, when people are getting treatment in hospital, like you're saying. You're like, at the mercy of them. It, it upsets me. And I know another lady that her son's undergoing, like, massive treatment. And he's going to be in hospital for three months. And she was like, I want to be making bone broth. I want to be having chicken, organic chicken and broccoli. And they're like, yeah, no, he can't have that. I've got, We've got to feed him the food that we've got here. And she can't bring in her own food? No. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. I feel like, you know, there's so much. That You've only got to look at it. Like whatever goes in your mouth, your body's going to absorb, right? And it's like if people are in these like touch and go situations where they're fighting for their life and I can see how like that can make someone so angry. And like, especially being a mother myself, it's like, but we know that shit. Yeah. And I think it becomes quite frustrating. Um, Even for Tom, like what I learned, I thought that he would need like the smoothies and, and, yeah. and that sort of stuff. But actually my, my team said, like, not my NHS team, my other team that I created, um, they said, no, he needs like warmth. He needs the broth. He needs the to warm his... Nourishment. Yeah, he needs nourishment. He doesn't need... That's like a bit cold and harsh for him, actually. He needs warmth. Okay, so did you become quite strict with his diet? Oh, I was so strict. <laughs> so Did you ever strict. see him like try to sneak some Me sweets in or anything? Me would like go head to head, with ar- like with just arguing about what he was eating. So what were you cooking? Like just he- really healthy food. Um, and he, not- we did go and see like a nutrition nutritionist and the stuff that they, like they wanted to fatten him up, but it wasn't about fattening him up. It was about feeding him the right food. Like yeah. obviously he'd lost a lot of weight when he um, did radio and chemo. He was really, really thin. And also the worry. He he was very energetic. Yeah. And then I think the worry for Tom just literally the pounds just dropped off him. Did you ever see him like trying to catch some sweets when you weren't looking and stuff then? He wouldn't he wouldn't ever do the sweets. His was like honey and cereal. So I would <laughs> allow like certain <laughs> cereals, but then um and he One was mouthful. having and he was having like lactose free milk. But then I think when you research the lactose-free milk, that's got quite a lot of sugar in it. So I was like, right, you can only be limited to this amount. And then like the honey and the maple syrup, it was like he was Buddy the Elf. I was like, you need to chill yourself down. <laughs> like flapping about. But also room. what was interesting to watch was, you know, um, especially when it started growing, I could see that his body was craving the sugar. You shrunk his tumours though, am I right? Yeah. So his first tumour we got down to... I and can't you know, believe we just glazed over that, but you shrunk his tumours through the protocol that you found. Yeah. And I think it's important for people to know that, that we, like we say, we feel powerless, but knowledge is power. And when you're like a little fountain of knowledge like you are, it's like, it's so important like to share it and stuff as well. But to shrink a tumour when they almost gave you no hope is just so remarkable. And then that gave Tom so much hope after that. He needed that. Like we had significant reduction. People don't get significant reduction. And that's with no one going in and cutting the tumour away. His tumour was inoperable. It literally had exploded in his head and we brought it back to, you know, significant reduction. And when he was quite poorly and undergoing the treatment and stuff, I mean, I remember you showing me some pictures of his blood. Like he was well. Yeah. Technically, you kept him well. Until the last, like, the, the end of his life, and that's when I got worried, and that's when we flew to Spain and we did um, other stuff. I hit it hard because also he wanted to get on that tour and I wanted to get him on the tour. That's what he, that's really, really what he wanted to do. So how would, how do I get him to that point? But before that, you know, we all had sickness bugs. Tom didn't get the sickness bug. Like, we actually went on this camping trip and it literally spread like wildfire. Everyone got this sickness bug. Him, who's like meant to be Mr. Dying. Yeah, Mr. Dying sick over there. He's just sat on 
on his little sun lounger, chilling, getting some vitamin D and and not, rain. and not throwing up. He didn't get COVID when people got COVID. So just a, a couple of the things, if like people did want to research it, what would be some of your like go-to stuff? Um, I am massively interested in um, homeopathy now. Yeah. And for me, I didn't know about it. And I think, um, you know, you're sort of like, who are these ladies with the crazy balls? Like, that's what I sort of thought. I was like, oh, that's all weird. Oh, I don't know. And when I had a meeting with my homeopath, I was like, oh, I'm really worried. I don't really know what it is. Obviously, it's non-invasive. Nothing's going to actually kill you. More natural you. than anything we're being yeah, given, isn't it? Yeah, it's literally part plant and it's in a distilled little water you can take drops. But for me, I actually did... Um, Oh my God, Brogan, what's the word that I said that I did? What's it called? When you do like the test on someone. With the blood test? No, 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 no. Like <laughs> I did my little thing to Tom because I didn't know if protocol. I believe. No, it's not protocol. You did which thing to Tom? No, what's, what's it called? Placebo. I did oh, my yeah. own placebo to Tom. Okay. Is it placebo? Trial, well, whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I did something. Anyway. She he, did it, folks. He uh, said that he was feeling really down. So I started giving him a remedy um, that the homeopath told me to give to him and literally within two days, he was like up and he was happy. What is that? Can anyone do that? Like, what is it? Could I use it if I was running, feeling run down? What, what, yeah. what have been in that? Tell me. Well, it's called Prospus. That's okay. what the remedy's called. I don't really know what's in it, but it makes you feel better. So okay. say if you, like, you know, I'm not a homeopath, so I can't. No, but you are still educated and been exposed to a lot of stuff that other people Yeah, and haven't. even now with my kids, so say if they get poorly, I start giving them, as soon as there's like something happening, I'll give them belladonna, aconite and chamomilla. Okay, and what's that? And like that's called, that is actually called an ABC. So I've got a remedy that's ABC remedy and I start giving it to them. Where can you get that for anyone who's listening to this? Um, you can actually get uh, them from a lady called Lisa who sells homeopath. We'll yeah, we've got, we've got to attach this. Um, Lisa, but you can just go on like, there is a Helios kit that you can get, which I think, you know, I run a, a little performing arts school. Little, it's quite no, big. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know why she, she's sitting there underselling herself. Every time I speak to her, I think, oh my God, you make me feel like I'm not doing anything. <laughs> she's so busy. Yeah, so at the performing arts school, um, someone got hurt the other day and Kelsey went, we need a Helios kit here. I went, the parents will think we're mad if we just pull out the remedy. Do you need a remedy? Which is mad though, isn't it? Because here is the most natural thing we can give. Yeah, I can, can give your, se your kid a pharmaceutically made painkiller, but yeah. yeah, I've got something natural and we're like, oh, what a weirdo. Yeah. What the, she walks and grounds barefoot. She's definitely a vegan. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We're like, oh, crystal ball people. When really we I take do have a few crystals though. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we'll get into that. But do you know what I mean? It's like, we're like, oh, that's the weird shit. When really it's the most natural thing that there is. Yeah. It's changed my life. And I know that there's, you know, there's so many different homeopaths out there and people that you can go to. Like I, if anyone comes to me and says, oh, uh, I'm feeling like this and got chest infection and I can't shift it. I'm like, do you want to see my homeopath? Yeah. Like I send everyone there because I just think, you know, even if you're going to go, you can do both. Tom did both. And I think that's the beauty of what you're saying here, right? You're not sitting here going, oh, you shouldn't do this. It's like everything can go hand in hand. It doesn't have to be one or the other. And like what you did for him gave him a longer life. Yeah. And that's the truth. And it, it massively helped him. Everything we did down the alternative route massively, massively helped him. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to attach your homeopath for a little tag and we can have a little look. Yeah. So Lisa's the one. We'll tag Lisa. In yeah, that. amazing. So at what point did you think, shit? Um, the last Christmas we had together, I thought, not I thought, oh, sh do you know what? I, that's a lie because even then I didn't think like that. I, d I don't think I did. I thought I'm going to make him better. So... I think all the time when everything was going wrong or, you know, we had a, a turn down a different road because we were we were on the, sh the home stretch and then things would come in. Um, in that December, I was worried because his eyes started shutting a little bit. But then we went out to Spain and I did three we weeks in this clinic in Spain and it was absolutely magical. Uh, it was called the Budwig Centre okay. in Spain. And that was funny because even when I was there, so I was only meant to go for a week because obviously I had the kids. So I was like to mum, look, I'm going to go for the week. I'll settle him. I'll come yeah. away and then someone can come out here. But obviously when I got out there and I, you know, I saw how the clinic with was your running. Peoples. Yeah. And I yeah. was like, mum, I'm not coming home. She was like, what? I said, no, I need to be here with him. And by the end of it, um, Kathy that runs the, the clinic was like, 
Kelsey, you could actually get a job here. 100%. Because I knew also, even down to like, because I'm so good with timetables and slotting things in because of like the kids. Juggling. Teach. I think you were yeah. just a juggler. Yeah. I was like, oh no, that person's meant to be in that room now. And that person's there. And they're like, oh, here she is running the clinic. <laughs> here she is taking <laughs> over again. I actually was. I was like, oh. but I loved it. And I got to experience, you know, even going to Spain for three weeks, I was meant to be there. And, and things just happened to me and Tom. Uh, he was a massive manifester and stuff just, you know, was brought to him. He wanted this dendritic cell therapy. So I had a meeting um, with a company who were actually in Sp in Spain. We were in Torremolinas and they were in Marbella. So not far. Like yeah. if he wanted the treatment, we could have gone and whatever. We had this call and they were brutal. They were brutal. What they do were you mean? So it was dendritic cell therapy that Tom wanted. Yeah. And Sorry, just to stop you there. What would have been the benefit to this? So the dendritic cells, you might have to research this a little bit more, <laughs> but it pretty much they take your own blood, do something to your blood, put it back in you, and then your blood then fights the T cells. Okay. So basically you build your own army to go back in Builds and fight the cancer. System stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Pretty much. You're building the... Yeah. So, um, so we had this call and like I said, they were basically like, well, he's got the worst sort of cancer you can possibly get. So yeah, we could do it. Don't know if it's going to work, blah, blah, blah. I was like, they were a bit brutal. But they wanted 50 grand. Hmm. And we had a pot of money, but we didn't have 50 grand left in that that pot. I was like, Tom, I don't think you're going to be able to get the dendrosic cells. Like, I've not got 50 grand. He was like, Kels, I want them. Even after that phone call, he still wanted it. Yeah, he wa no, yeah, he wanted it. But again, with Tom, I don't know why. He was just leaving everything to me. He was just like, I want it. Can you make it happen? I'm like, okay, I've got to try and make this happen, right? I'm a mum, I can do this. <laughs> so then I was speaking to the clinic that we were at at the Budwig Centre and I said, look, we've just had this call, but I've not got 50 grand for it. And then um, one of the guys who worked there, his sister made these dendritic cells, but for 13 grand. Wow. I know. Was there much of a positive result from them? Well, Tom, so we had the, so whilst we were on this uh, trip, they took his blood and um, they said it would take like three weeks to make the, the dendritic cells, but it didn't. So then Tom came back, he went on the tour and then on, so he came back on the, on the tour on the Friday, the Saturday he was meant to go and fly out to um, Spain, to Spain, but I couldn't get him there. He was too ill by then. And, um, I flew the doctor over here with the dendritic cells. She couldn't speak a word of English. Don't I... touch it in your front room. Pardon? Did she do it in your front room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She came and done... No, he was up in the bed and she came and, and, and did the... Because it literally was... She had the cells and she just needed okay. to inject him with them. Um, but it was all too... It was too... It was too late by then. But I just wanted him to know that I'd got him the dendritic cells, like... I did everything you wanted me to do. I've done it, Tom. And did it have much of a result? Or do you think, yeah, just too late? I think it was too late for him. And also then it goes down to the soul and then we're in a different place, and aren't we? But what was he like on the tour? Do you know what was so funny, Broken, even with dendritic cells, is that the, I would go to the ends of the earth for Tom. And obviously I'm going to pick the Spanish doctor up. I can't speak Spanish. So I'm like, I need a translator. Where am I getting a translator from? I literally go to where I teach at K2K and so they've got K to K and then they've got a CrossFit. I went into the CrossFit and was like, can anyone speak Spanish? There was Grace, amazing Grace. Oh my God. Grace Grace literally went, I've got stuff today, but I'm I'm, I'm booking mm -hmm. a day off. She went, I'm, I'll come to the airport with you. I've literally got goosebumps. Oh. She came to the airport with me. She doesn't know me. We're not friends. Oh, you've never met her? I've never met her in my life. I just went in there and went, I'm really in dire need. Can anyone speak Spanish? And then Grace went, I can. And she was like, I'll come with you. How beautiful Like, is that? how not... Like, there are really kind, honest human beings out there. And she came, and then she had to come back to my house. And obviously, she could just see, the like, what we were living in then. Because Tom was, get, like, getting bad by then. Um, and, yeah, and then, she, then we took her back to the... What was he like on the tour? He loved the tour. He wanted to do the tour. And that I needed to facilitate getting him on that tour. And that's why we went to Spain, because he wanted to do the tour. And he loved it. And, you know... Really, that was the fans' like final goodbye to him. It was his farewell, and he came out every night and sang "Glad You Came." How long? Um, the tour was, was like two weeks that he did. So it's still a lot though, and to go out to all those energies yeah. and out there and have to perform. Mm. But he, he didn't really perform. He just he sat on a chair and sung. 
he really wanted to sing, but he was started to gradually lose his voice. But he got to do it all, really. He got to do it all, and that's what he wanted to do. And, you know, um, I took Aurelia and uh, Kelsey, my best friend, her little boy, Albie, who Tom is his godfather. They came to the O2, we were in a box, and they got to see, like, you know, Aurelia got to see her dad perform at the O2. So. Oh, no, not many kids can no. say that. That's amazing. So at what point towards the end did you think, I'm going to have to accept this now? Uh, not until really the like the bitter end really and i just said to him like you you can go i knew that he was holding on because there was a like i think it, i always remember the days it was like friday yeah and um again going to the ends of the earth i was like he needs fluid so i was ringing around getting him in getting drips to come to my house getting him vitamin drips literally i, th I think the um the like nhs and the hospice were like oh, don't it's kelsey again <laughs> <laughs> don't pick no, up that phone yeah. call <laughs> no because i was going to other people i was like right i've, I've got a clinic that I've, pa I've paid them the money they're gonna come but then st christopher's hospice turned up and they, and they said do you want to come and have some fluids at the hospice and i think when he wanted to die i think he did want to die at home but then for me he went into that hospice because he actually wanted to fight he did I know him so well and there's no way he thought he was going into that hospice to die. He wanted them fluids and he wanted some more time. Um, so we went in on the Friday. Uh, my friend Evie came to see him, who is a witch. Which one of us? <laughs> of she, which of woman? She's, yeah, she's a witch. So Evie came to see him and they had this... I couldn't go when he first went in on the Friday. I, 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 that was my day of realisation. And I actually just sat there with uh at my mum's house and I was crying my eyes out and, and my mum was doing hair and then my brother because she's a hairdresser my brother came in my youngest brother and what would he have been he would have been uh, what is he now 17 15 at the time 14 15 and he, he was like Kels and I couldn't speak and I was just crying and he sat there with me not saying a word for about 40 minutes and I, it must have been the most painful 40 minutes of his life thinking I don't know what to no, say. No one can say anything. What, and also, he's 15. He's going to lose his brother, basically. He's like, the, my brother's like, I don't think I've come to terms with it again. But as well, like him going into that hospice is like, you had those reins for so long yeah, and, and I, they weren't yours. No. And that and must that have was, been when you were like, Shh, I've got to let this go. Yeah. Like, I've just gone cold. No, no. and I did. And, and honestly, I did let go at that point because his mum stayed with him every night because I thought I need to come back for the kids for them to have normality. And I, I probably wouldn't have done that before. I would not have let anyone been in there with him without, like, not, no, I don't trust his mum. Like, obviously, I love his mum and, and I wanted her to be there. But that was me being like, I'm, I'm, I'm letting go of of everything. Control. Yeah, the control. Because I was a control freak, and I probably am a massive control freak. Yeah, but in a beautiful way. Because yeah. only you want the best for people. But like, how did you? How do you explain to your kids that their dad's died? I don't. Do you know what? I always get asked this, but so, I was you? so yeah. honest, and I just said to the kids, "So on the day you're gonna cry, don't cry." I know, Jess, have we got tissues? <laughs> She's going to cry. <laughs> I felt like I was going to cry earlier and I was like, I've got no tissues. <laughs> um, so when he, she knew something was happening. Like Aurelia was literally um, sent from, I, I just, I think as well, like your children are sent to you for like a reason. Oh my God. So she was going around with my auntie and my mum and my auntie are like the absolute nuts. Like I could not have done anything without them. They literally took control of my children because, and, and even like Kelsey, her family, like other family members took control of Albie because we were just living this. We were a bit incestuous as well. Like me, Kels, <laughs> Dean and Tom were like best friends. Yeah. Dean didn't, couldn't even come to the like hospice. Your family doesn't have to be your no. family. Do you know what I mean? You've got your soul family. And stuff. So, um, so then on that Friday, I was like, right, I know. And then Julia taking her out and she'd said to a shopkeeper, um, oh, my dad's really ill and he's in hospital and his eyes shut now. So I was like, oh. so she obviously knows like, Something's happen, happening. So when Tom's breathing changed, so I had this magical Sunday night with Tom and I said to him, like, you can go. It's fine. I'm obviously not going to be fine, but I'm going to be fine. Like, you don't want to be here anymore. So you need to go. Like, if, if And was he responding? Yeah, he, he, he understood everything. Like, he was then still talking. We were still oh, okay. talking at this point. And was like, he scared? He was so scared to die, but I honestly think when he died, he wasn't scared anymore. And I think when he like passed, he probably went, 
What was that? Why have I been so worried all this time? Like, what was that? Like, he, because he had the most peaceful, calming death. And that's another thing when I talk about, you know, doing doing everything to keep you healthy. Because when Tom was in them final um, days, Tom was healthy. His liver wasn't failing. His kidneys were amazing. You know, everything within the body was doing great. So I I know that I did my job by keeping him as healthy as possible. So he didn't go into them final days of death being like, oh, my, my liver's packing in, I'm on a drip and I'm doing this. And so what was the reason then the tumour had just taken over? Yeah, I, do you know what, Brogan? I don't actually really know. And then that's why, it, to me, it's the subtle. Like, no one really said anything to me, like, as in... It's got 10 times bigger, he's going to lose his speed. Because we didn't do an MRI or anything like that, so it was just, like, his body was shutting down. He'd, ha he'd, had, en he'd had enough. And I know that's so hard, because, obviously, for me, as a, uh, his wife, you go, oh, why have you had enough? Like, why are you not going to fight? But it was really hard for Tom to live in, to live here as having the brain tumour. is. Do you know well, what I mean? he was somewhere between here and there, wasn't he? No, no, no. But I mean, like, in this lifetime, he couldn't continue in this lifetime going forward with a brain tumour. He just couldn't. He'd been in this boy band. He'd, you know, he was an idol and he didn't feel like Tom Parker anymore. No. No. And probably even to be my husband, like, to be my husband, he probably thinks, oh, what sort of husband am I? Obviously, I never made him feel like no, that. of course. But of you're... Course. You know, I, I, we knew each other so well. We were literally like the boy and girl version of each other. So I would knew, know what his faults were. Like he didn't even need to speak. I would know. When we were in them hospital appointments with each other, we would know what each other were thinking. I think in the hospital appointments, he would think, Get me out it. of here. And he'd think, fucking hell, my wife, like, <laughs> do not cross her. Because I am so chilled. I am such a chill person and I'm not angry. But when you I'm rattle me. With my husband's health. You'll know about it. Yeah. And they used to say, oh, we know you're giving him all the remedies and stuff at home. I'm like, yeah, I am. And look at him. Yeah. And when you said you can go, what yeah. did he say? He said, thank you. And we had this moment where he like put his wedding ring then on my finger. And um, I was singing to him. I was singing to him, um, even though he was obviously the singer and he would take the piss out of me singing. I can <laughs> sing. I can sing. Just to clarify, I yeah, can actually sing. Because you've been to that theatre school I've stuff. been to performing arts school. I can sing. So I'm just like not to sing. as good as him. Yeah, okay. Like, he was like one he, of the world's biggest boy bands. He was the singer. So <laughs> he would be like, and then, but that was like a, re, a, a beautiful moment that I'll never, ever forget forever. We just laid in this bed and um, my friends were waiting outside because where the day had been so busy and everyone had been in to see him, he was probably thinking everyone's come to say goodbye. Um, so my my best friends, Sasha and Kelsey, sat by the, the door of the hospital room so no one could go in. They were like, this is your time. You need the time yeah. of him. Like, no one's coming in. And even, like, then Tom's mum came to, like, come in the room and, like, to, to obviously spend the night. And they were like, Kelsey's just like, no. I think they all thought, what was actually going on in there? <laughs> Oh my god, no, you didn't. No, did you? we didn't. Oh my god, could you imagine? No. You did. No. <laughs> you thought about it. No, thought about it. No, no, no. It was a really like ro like a romantic moment, like our our final romance together, which was just beautiful. And we had that. And I said, I know the path now that you want me to be on, and and I will do that now for our children. I know what what you want me to do, basically. And thank you. And I thanked him everything that he'd done for me, everything he'd given me, the 13 years that we'd had together. Like, I I just said, thank you, Tom. Like, you, I appreciate it so much. It's amazing. And how were the girls? I think we went off this road when you told them. So he, she said, already, um, so, uh, they said, my dad's poorly in a hospital with a sore eye. Yeah, and then, so, uh, so I had the Sunday night. Then um, by the Wednesday... So, that, can you know, sometimes you pick up before death, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then the Monday, you had a, a really good day. And I think everyone was like... Maybe it's not it. Yeah. But I, I know, because Evie had told me. Yeah. Um. So then I... um. So then, but when I went in on the Wednesday, I said to her... So she was going to nursery and I said, um... Mummy's got to go and see Daddy now at the hospital. At the hospital, I said, um, but Mummy's going to make sure that Angels come and take Daddy today. Like we're not going to see Daddy anymore now. Don't cry. Oh, no, um, Jesus. She was just like, okay. 
Because like, I explained it like that, she was like, okay, mum. And then that was it. And then I went. And then after he died, we actually all went on like a, a night out. Like we went to the pub because I was like. She had sex in the hospice. No, I didn't have sex in the hospice. <laughs> Um, we went out to the pub and we drank and we celebrated his life because because it is like what it, else do you do? And as well, like he did so much with his life. Yeah, it it's happened. almost like he wasn't really. Obviously, he was robbed of his short life. But those years that he had, it's like cliche. It's like what they say, like isn't it? Like it doesn't matter about the years you have in your life. It's the life that's in your yeah. Years. And, and then you look at his life. So thirty three years that he lived here. He did so much in 33 years that people would never dream of doing. So are you meant to live for a really long time or are you meant to live this short little life but do everything you want in it? Yeah. You know, for him, the bit of his life that he probably feels completely robbed of is the fact that he's not going to see his kids grow old. Like, yeah. of course. But everything that he's achieved, even the light that he's shone in the brain tumour world and, and given me the baton to pass that on to be like, more needs Raise to be done. Raise yeah. and help people. Did you ever have a discussion? Was he ever like, look, I want you to go on and be happy and meet someone? Was he, was he ever, or could he ever like talk about that kind of thing? No, uh, do you know what? Tom was actually out of me and Tom. Tom was more jealous than me. Like Tom was the one that if I went out and, like if we, like our arguments, if we'd have an argument, it would be Tom being jealous, not oh, me. Okay. Which not, is hilarious because you're like all across the world, cooing girls all over yeah, you. But he would, <laughs> he would be the one for me. Because I, I like, obviously he trusted me. Of course he yeah, trusted course. me. But I don't think at them, he could never say to me, oh, Kelsey, yeah, go and be like, go and meet someone else and be really happy. Look, he, I have seen psychics and had these readings and he's always come through and been like, what are you doing? <laughs> go and be happy. Like, go and be happy, Kels, because that's what you deserve and that's what you need. I know that he'd want me to be happy. And, and what does happiness look like? I don't know. And I think, like, with well, some of the conversations that I was having before, it's like, and it's so hard, right? Because you were kind of under the world's eye, yeah? And then when he died, there was so much attention on you. And then eventually you did ha meet someone and have a relationship. Yeah. And, like, you, you were almost open up to, like, anyone commenting or feeling like they had a right. And I think... It's so difficult. Like, when is the right time? When is the right time? But also, Brogan, that is part of the grief process. Like, ha no one could give me what Sean actually gave me at that time. Mm. Like, my friends and my family couldn't do that for me. Sean brought me so much, and I needed that then. Yeah. Like, I... You can't... I don't think you can regret anything. No. But, um... Were you getting like, obviously, because I know that they put it in the papers and stuff, were you like, I just want my privacy back? Did you feel like that's something you wanted to keep for you? And I was quite shocked at the attention that was on me. I mean, when I did first meet Sean, I was like, look, I'm I'm not your average girl to meet now. Like, I'm, I met him at a wedding and, yeah, I, sa I said, like, you sort of don't really know what you're getting into. And I didn't really, like, even last... Valentine's Day, I went to go and watch my friends sing and Sean was just with me and we went with Kelsey and Dean and a few other friends. Well, there was about like eight, uh, about eight of us that went up to London and I got followed by Paps. At the, at, I was at the train station and um, the, the train guard came over and was like, oh, do you know them guys with big cameras all taking pictures of you over, the, over there? And they'd followed me from my house to the train station and I was genuinely so shocked. I'm like... Why do they care what I'm doing on Valentine's Day? Like, yeah. it's so because sad. Was that though, hard to deal with? Yeah, it is because I always had the fame sort of behind Tom, didn't I? Like, I did TV shows with him. Like, he was so successful, and and you know, I'm a trained actress, and I've had my like done bits in the industry and whatever, but nothing to for the for, to be papped on my own. Whereas if me and Tom would come out of nightclubs, like the paps would be there and we'd get paps and whatever else. Um, you didn't really sign up for the last bit though, did you? No. Yeah. It was it was quite crazy. I was like, oh my god, they're they're outside. They're waiting for me and they're outside my house. And and I think I went and dropped one of the kids to uh, yeah, both of them to school. I'm, I dropped them to nursery and then I came back and sat on my drive and then I li literally I looked over and there's a pap taking pictures of me while I'm sat on my drive. And I was like, 
this is crazy. Well, I suppose part of you probably thought it's all over because he's not here anymore. Yeah. And this is an interesting conversation, right? Yeah, here we go. Do you think you can have two soulmates? I ha- my friend Evie said that, you, that, you know, there is a twin flame. Yeah. Because I feel like we get so caught up, like there's got to be this one person for us. And it's like, even the conversations that I've had with people who, like, who are my friends who are a lot older, it's like, you can have that person for then. And you can still like, as much as Tom sounded like he was, he's your soulmate and everything, it doesn't stop. But I mean, realistically, you're gonna live to like, you're a hundred, isn't it? Yeah, obviously. Given the grace and, especially with what yeah. you got going on in the protocol, um, the grace and freedom of like, having that again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and that sort of scares me but then makes me excited at the same time. I don't know what my life looks like now. And I've only lived my life with Tom. Mm. Like I was 19 when I met him. Oh, I'd, I'd been in a relationship for like two years and which, well, yeah, it was two years. And then I just split up with this guy and it was, I'd been single for three months and I met Tom and I was like, oh my God. And then we were together for like, you know, we, we did have a little break and whatever yeah, else yeah, in yeah. there. But, we were together for 13 years. Jesus. Like, I don't know life without him. And I think that's why I sort of did like the, threw myself into, oh my God, I've, I've just got with someone. Like that's it, yeah. do you know what I mean? Cause I, I needed, I needed something because I was so used to probably having Tom and, and that, that love comfort and comfort. Well. And you know, that, that's what I'm saying. There's only so much my friends and my family could do. It's different. They can't it's come to my house every night and be yeah. like, oh yeah, 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 I love you so much. You're amazing. <laughs> yeah, do you know no, what I mean? It's... But, yeah, so when I fell down the Kelsey Rabbit Parker hole, uh, Kel- Kelsey Parker Rabbit hole, I was like, I want to meet your mum because there is something that is just so resilient and a bit, a little bit like when I said in the beginning, you're like, shit's going to happen. And I think... The, like how quickly that we process that and like understand it and just move forward is like almost affect, well, it's almost a reflection, isn't it? Of like our success in life. Cause you're like, okay, this is happening, but I can stop and I can wallow or I can just keep going forward. So going back to your childhood, is that kind of the way you were brought up or are you just like this? Because there'll be people that are listening to some of the stuff you've done before, listening to this and it's like, well, my husband's dying and I can't get out of bed. No, and I get that. I completely get that. I think I've always been like it. I've been, I don't know what it is because you can't explain, can you? No, I you? can't, I can't. You I can't, can't explain. explain what it is, but I just but have this ability. When I listen to those ability. podcasts, I thought, is she talking shit? How can you be sitting? You're like, no, because you're saying this is happening. This is what I understood. This is happening, but there's still joy here. Yeah. I'm still having little wins. I'm still watching Bodhi walk. I'm still, yeah, and we haven't just got to live in this. And, this part. Example, like when I was about uh, nine or ten, my mum and probably ten, my mum and dad were splitting up, and and it was uh, um, obviously I can't really talk about that, but it was quite traumatic for a child of that age yes. to go through, um, and I actually, well, again, was okay. My mum went to school and she wanted to say to my teacher, you know, this is happening at home. But I had a gleaming report. And do you know what? My daughter is exactly the same. I had parents evening last night. They, like, her teacher was like, she's amazing. She's so caring. She's kind. She loves to learn. Like, this situation that we are in and the life we're living hasn't affected her. She can go to school and she can get on with her life, even though she doesn't have a dad at home. And I could do that. And I think it must, I don't know if it, maybe it's from my... I think, I think it's you shift your mindset, don't you? Like, yeah, your dad's not here, but your mum's here, your nan's here, and all of this stuff can still go on. It's looking at the positive, not yeah, the really what is. you've not got. Like, for me, it was, it was a bonus that that all happened when I was 10. Like, I can't go down into that mm. because... Did you, when Tom passed, did you, did you think that I'm never going to feel joy like this again? Did you, did you get into any of the ruts or were you just like... That was meant to happen in a weird way. I when he was first when he first was first when he went into that hospice, I always talk about it. I couldn't get out of bed. That was the time when I couldn't get out of bed. I didn't want to face what was happening. I was so scared of what it looked like and how scared he was, and I couldn't fix this. This was the point where I couldn't fix anything, and I had no. to let go and let go of the reins and and the control. 
And it felt like I had bricks on me and I was laying in bed. I wasn't eating. I wasn't doing anything. And Kelsey came in and she went, come on, you've got to go and see him in the hospice. He'll be so happy to see you. You need to go then. I was like, I can't. I can't go and see him. She went, you've got to. She went, come on. She came upstairs with like three grapes and went, eat these grapes. <laughs> <laughs> I've only put three because I feel really sick in them situations as well. No, know some people can eat. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get like that. Like, just falls off you. It's like adrenaline. I can't sick. eat. It made me feel sick. The, the whole situation, I just felt sick from the moment I woke up. I was just living off coffee. No wonder Bodhi came. Well, Bodhi had come early already. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh no, that was before. But because, that was the yeah. same sort of thing. Yeah, the same time. They're like, still going through it. No, but as in like when Thomas first diagnosed, it was the same situation. I couldn't eat. I felt sick. Then we got to the hospice. I couldn't eat. I felt sick. Um, and. I think then that was, I get why people get that afterwards. I laid on that sofa after and I couldn't have people around and friends and some friends and family because what do I say to them? What do we talk about? Like the day after everyone came to my house, like, and and I think I was just still having this bit of like- Shock, adrenaline. Shock, out of body. And I do cool. talk about that. I, I've, I've probably been having an out of body experience. Straight away after he died, I definitely was out of body for about- a good eight months, then went to see Evie. She put me back into my body a bit, <laughs> but I was still so blurry. It's only this this year that that fog's lifted for me. Well, he was an extension of you as well, like what you were saying, from being someone like in those teenage years and like navigating your way through like adulthood and growing Look, up. We together. bought a house together and we had children together. You like, you know, even saving to get the mortgage and yeah, the whatever yeah, the whole else, journey. everything. So, you know, like, and he was the boss, Brogan. Oh, I, only became, I only became I only became the boss. Like, him. You would have loved him. <laughs> yeah. This is nothing as you. The conversations you two would have had. <laughs> He's probably watching yeah. anyway. Like, well, these two come up for yeah. it. <laughs> but for people that are going through, or like in your situation, you know, like looking, caring for people that are terminally ill, like what what kind of hope could you offer them? Like, what would you say to them? I think you just try to, you have got to try and remain as positive as possible. I spoke to a, another wife this week and I said, look, whatever you're doing, it's only for positive. Even if the, the process is that he's going to die, look, ultimately we are all going to die, aren't we? That yeah. is it. We are promised. That's the one thing we're promised in this lifetime. Um, but what you're doing is making him healthy. So it's not a painful death. Yeah. And, I think for me, my focus was that and that's how I was positive and I got through it because I was like, I am going to give him the most positive experience he can have in this. Yeah, and I think it's like what you said, right? It's We don't like talking about death because it's like, oh, that's so uncomfortable, that's so bad. Like, And when it happens, everyone's like, what the fuck do we say, right? But maybe... It's inevitable, yeah. right? Tom lived such an inspirational life and it inspired you to carry on living yours because his might have stopped, but yours hasn't. Yeah. If my life's not stopped and my life has to continue and I'm continuing my life for for Tom. Exactly. But what, what he wanted me to do, what he wanted me to achieve, he would be so proud of me. Of, of you know, every decision I've made, he would be proud of me. For either making the right decision or the wrong decision, he'd be like, well, at least you fucking made a decision. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm terrible at that too, making decisions. Because I'd have to ask him everything. I'd ring him and text him. And it's that, that's what I miss. Like, being able to run ideas. Security. Yeah, ideas past him as well. He, I have now morphed into him. I am like the new Tom Parker. Well, your mum and dad. Yeah, well. yeah, and and just I met someone, uh, one of our a mutual friend, and um, literally a couple of days ago, and he kept sitting there crying about Tom, and I was like, it's okay, it's okay. But he was telling me stories of what Tom did, and it, he <laughs> was hilarious. There literally was only one Tom Parker, and I got to marry him. So, yeah, I mean, out of all the thousands of adoring fans in the world. Um, I'm so pleased you came on here because, like, for me, you're the definition of getting there, right? You're, like, just seem to be, like, no matter what life throws at you, just getting headstrong. Um, in that bag is something for you. Oh, wow. Well, we can... Yeah. And that is the thing. That is, that is all... you can get there. And however hard your road is. And we've all got... Do you know what my thing to Tom I used to always say is? There's worse off people than us, Tom. Yeah. Come on. Let's just get on with it. Yeah. I think and that is always... it. And but people would think, oh no, I'd hate to be in her situation. So what's next? Because you've got the drama school, we've got loads of Oh, what is this? This is cute. This but is your initials be cute. on it. Did you see the front? Yeah. <laughs> 
you are already there. Yeah. Because ah. like, we chased, like, oh, we got, I just got to get this bit. I just, uh. <laughs> so what's next? Um, ultimately, happiness and a future for the kids and a happy future for them. And that's why, you know, I can't be down and depressed because... It's about my children yeah, and now. They've still got their childhood. Do you know? They've I mean? still got their childhood. How can I take that away from them? I did get emotional. At parents' evening last night because I thought he'd be so happy with this report and he'd be a little bit shocked. But she is, and and then also I need to then take a step back and think, I've done that. Like that's been me yeah. as well. Like I have made this happy for. Her. It's not been a bad experience. Like I've tried to make it positive, happy, and she is a kind and gorgeous. And obviously, so is my son. You know, <laughs> I always talk a lot about Aurelia because she is the oldest. Yeah, but they are. I've done such a good job. And Tom's mum said that to me. She was like, "You have done such an amazing job." And it choked me at Christmas. She said, "You've done such an amazing job of raising them kids, girls." And I'm so proud of you. And I know he would be. And I was like. Because so obviously it's coming from his mum as well. Like yeah. it means everything to me. But hopefully he is proud. And he will be. for me, the future, you know, I, I want to speak more and shine a bigger light on brain tumours. And not even the brain tumours. Like everything else that you've learned. That everything just... else that, that that can help people. I'm. I just feel like I was put here to help. And I've learned so much. And... The irony of it all was Tom was the one that used to research and he would get so angry with me. Like, you're just not bothered about things. You're just not bothered about it. And I'm like, no, I don't really care. And then I was thrown into this situation. Why was I put here? What was my journey? What was my reason? Like, there's got to be something out of this actual shit show. Just about to use that word. That was my, that well, is my life, you know, there's got to be something out of it broken that I can help people. And you're doing these retreats as well, right? So yeah. we're shining the light on all of that stuff. I want to add the homeo woman on here. Yeah. Is that what we're called? Like the homeopath. 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 Not the homeo. The homeo. homeo. <laughs> um, and some other links and anything that you think would be useful to people that have like listened to this. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time.